Hi, and welcome to um, the Aquavitae Low Traffic Life webinar session. Today we have uh, Bas Wenstein, who will uh, give his presentation here on uh, further defining the flat oyster seed production. Um, just before we begin, I just want to talk briefly about Aquavitae. Aquavitae uh, aims to increase aquaculture production and in and around the Atlantic Ocean by developing new species, processes and products. The focus of the product is placed on low trophic species such as algae, sea urchins and shellfish. Aquavitae will offer new opportunities to enhance uh, the environmental, so, uh, societal and economical wealth of aquacultures and communities. The product will implement 11 case studies across the Atlantic Basin, mainly located in Europe, uh, Africa and uh, South America taking into uh, things such as uh, market potential, sustainability, business and so socioeconomic analysis, policy framework and training. The project will work to create real and meaningful collaboration between researchers, industry and other agriculture stakeholders, stakeholders in the Atlantic area. I will post a link in the chat uh, and you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. But enough about uh, the project itself and let's get our focus on to Sebastian. So Sebastian, just before you, you begin with your presentation, could you please tell me why did you become interested in, in sea or in flat oyster seed production? Uh, I used to work together with another partner from the Aquavitae project, which is also Strand. So I uh, used to work as a, um, as a research assistant for her and working together with her was actually the first time that I came in contact with uh, flat oysters in general or bivalve aquaculture in general. And that's actually where my interest uh, uh, started. I uh, I used to work for a lot of different uh, programs uh, back at my old job. And one of my old supervisors told me that I should uh, expand my horizons instead of uh, sticking to what I uh, used to know. And uh, yeah, the when I saw the flat oysters or when I saw the bife of aquaculture coming by, I saw it as an opportunity to uh, expand my horizons. So uh, that's where I picked it up uh, more or less. That's a very good and interesting approach, uh, but uh, let's get on with your presentation. Yes. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, as uh, as Kasper said, my name is Sebastian Wenzijn. I'm a master's student at the Gothenburg University. Uh, I'm originally from the Netherlands, but I'm uh, now living and studying here in uh, Sweden. Let's see if this. Yes, I will uh, give you a short introduction about uh, what I've done and how I got to this, uh, how I got to the point of this research. Then I will go a little bit further into the research. Then I will uh, show some of my results. And in the end, I will uh, have show you some conclusions and uh, questions that you have afterwards. So what happened, uh, as I said, to understand as to how I got to this subject, it's important to understand what happened to the flat oysters. As you can see in uh, in this slide, we have two maps of the flat oysters uh, spread amongst uh, northern Europe uh, in brown. Sadly, most of these um, um, oyster reefs have almost completely disappeared over time, and that was uh, is for a couple of reasons. Uh, since the seventeenth, yeah, since the seventeenth century, up until uh, far into the nineteenth century. Uh, these oyster beds have been uh, harvested by uh, fisher, fishing boats, like the ones you can see in this picture here. The, the, these dredgers were able to uh, gather a lot of oysters for uh, poor uh, coastal communities as a way to provide them with a cheap and reliable uh, 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 food source, rich in proteins. Uh, yeah, so that was a, it was a very stable, stable food source for them. Uh, but the dredgers were able to dredge so much away that the oyster reefs uh, slowly but gradually, gradually started uh, disappearing and there was no way to restock these uh, oyster reefs. Next to the fishery, the oyster reefs had another issue, which was uh, diseases. Here's a couple of them. Um, in green, on the right side, we have a happy flat oyster, the way it's supposed to look if you open them. On the top, in the red, in the red box, we have uh, an oyster which suffers from martiliosis, which is a digestive disease and is eventually lethal. And in the bottom, we have in the orange box an oyster which is uh, in the orange box which uh, suffers from bonomiosis, which causes lesions all over the oysters and is eventually also and lethal. Also I'm just going to mute that person. Yeah. Okay. I'll just be good again. Um, these um, 
Um, oh, sorry, I just need to pick up my. Oh yeah, so these diseases uh, uh, wreaked havoc, havoc together with the fisheries amongst the uh, oyster reefs in Europe, and altogether these two, um, uh, or the combination of these two events, uh, caused the oyster reefs to completely disappear in certain parts and are uh, on the threat of extinction in other parts of Europe. I would just uh, like to remind everybody that um, keep your microphone muted until the, the Q&A session at the end of the meeting. Otherwise, the sound's going to echo and it's going to be a lot of noise in the background. Um, yes, so there's a little bit of remaining production in Europe right now. As you can see on the right side, there's a small table of different countries in 2017, which still produced a little bit of flat oysters. Most of these flat oysters are used for uh, uh, food production in restaurants, as you can see on the picture on the left here, which is quite a shame because these oyster, oysters in general have uh, a couple of traits which are very beneficial to the local environment and also provide a very cheap source of food and proteins to a lot of um, coastal communities. So amongst this picture here is a couple of the, the beneficial traits that these uh, oysters have. Uh, increased water clarity, increased uh, fish production, increased oyster population, a cultural value as well, but most importantly, perhaps, is the improved water quality. As for humans, they offer certain traits which are, uh, or they have uh, certain nutritional values which are uh, very high and can provide potentially a very cheap source of food uh, uh, for people. So, talking about the current situation, on the top left corner, we can see. Uh, breeding ponds, which are uh, tanks up to a million liters of water. Uh, these tanks are uh, dug out of the dug out of earth or uh, blown out of rock. And these are places where they uh, which have a semi open connection to the to the sea. On the bottom, we can see breeding poles, which are mostly used in Norway. They basically work under the same concept where they have a semi open connection to the open sea. These two situations are uh, situations where they try to simulate what happens in the uh, open nature as much as possible, but then in a smaller uh, body of water. So this is our current situation, but we also have a desired situation, which is uh, on the left, on the right side, which is a picture of, uh, of a oyster hatchery. These oyster hatcheries are often very small buildings where it's uh, where a more intensive way of oyster uh, uh, culturing can be ta can take place, which is uh, a, a way better or is a better way of controlling whatever happens with these uh, oyster larvae in the uh, in the smaller uh, body of water. However, there are a couple of problems when it comes to uh, reliable seed production. As you can see, there's no solid protocols available. Right now, a lot of oyster farmers uh, use rules of thumb or gut feelings when it comes to producing uh, oysters. Uh, tanks can be collapsing. So if tank A and tank B are standing next to each other under the same conditions, could Tank B could collapse for no apparent reason, and tank A could be very happy and just continue whatever, uh, continue its way. And perhaps the most important part as to why uh, um, um, oyster hatcheries are still not a big thing is that they are unable to have out of season production. Uh, oyster larvae have a seasonal cycle where in the summer they, uh, or in the spring and in the summer they reproduce, and during the winter they go into some sort of a hibernation. Uh, a year, uh, if you if they were able to produce oysters year round, that would very benefit um, the oyster hatcheries uh, in their feasibility. So the aims for the report are uh, my report were to help solidify the current protocols uh, concerning reproduction and to gain further insight into smaller scale systems. So how did we do that? We we used uh, we we wanted to evaluate a model that is currently being used in these oyster hatcheries and oyster uh, uh, production ponds to be able to see uh, to be able to um, predict when oysters would uh, uh, reproduce, which is very important uh, uh, for the whole uh, reproduction cycle. We did that by looking at the uh, model made by Man, as you can see here, together with a. Uh, um, um, uh, by and also by adding the brooding time, which is also a model uh, created, uh, we also created. I will go a little bit into further detail after this slide. We looked at the model by looking at the four different response variables, which were first larvae, 
first larvae peak, which is was at 15 larvae per liter, first larvae peak at 30 larvae per liter, and the absolute highest larvae peak that we uh, found in these tanks. We took water samples uh, for food uh, consumption, um, for the food composition uh, in each of those tanks, and we looked at the relationship between temperature peaks and larvae peaks. So to understand as to what we did, it's important to also understand the life cycle of uh, oysters, which is a very nice picture taken here, and I will go down uh, through them uh, in, in these small blocks. So we start off off with the, what's called the swarming or the gametogenesis or the maturation period, which is calculated in these degree days, which is the the, uh, the man's model um, uh, um, end result. Then we get into the brooding period, which is uh, counted in the amount of days until spawning takes place. And then afterwards we get into the development stage, which is uh, also where I uh, cut off my research because I wanted to see the first part of the, the whole cycle of uh, oysters to be able to understand uh, this part of the cycle. So the degree days uh, by Ma man's model. Uh, this is the summation of the of how it works. Uh, temperature is here a main driver. Uh, and in the end, we get a certain sum of temperature, as it's called, until uh, maturation in oysters is complete. I will go, now go through what this means. So here we can see uh, 400 degree days, which is, give, which is a given by man's model. So these 400 degree days is what is required for the oyster to be able to, uh, to release their uh, oyster larvae. T1 is the exposure temperature uh, of that day for the oyster. T0 is the absolute minimum temperature that maturation takes place, which is also given by MON, which is seven degrees. And in addition, you also add the summation of degree days already gathered, which in the end results into what is called degree days total. And on the bottom here, we have a small little table which shows you the, uh, the date, the temperature of that day, and the actual uh, summation of degree days that we had. So on the right, you can see that on the 25th of May in 2019, we had 400 degree days, which is at the point where the oysters would then be uh, mature enough to start releasing their oyster larvae. On top of this, we also had a brooding period, which is also uh, uh, a calculation that we made. We took data from uh, three different papers and uh, resulted into the form uh, formula you can see below, which is uh, also taken uh, which is also added into the, the whole um, calculations uh, that we did. So we had two different research locations. We had Christina Bay in Sweden and we had Cartron Point in Ireland. Uh, in Ireland, it was a large semi-open uh, setup. Uh, and in Sweden, we had a small scale semi-open uh, setup that we used. So first I will start off with Ireland. Here we got data from another partner from the Aquavite project, which was uh, Colin Hannon. He uh, gave me data from 2019 in, until 2021. Here we took, uh, here we, we used the temperature, which we converted into degree days, and we looked at the larvae in uh, each of these ponds. As you can see in the pictures below, is the location that they use. So these are the results from, that we had from Ireland. So we'll go down the whole blocks again from the from the cycle. So we start again with the swarming period, which was 400 degree days, as given by Mum. Then we move into the brooding period, which we calculated would be between 9 and 13 days, which roughly translates to 100 to 110 degree days. And then we get into the spawning. So according to the predictions which we made, it would be the, the spawning would take place between 547 degree days and 570 degree days for these tanks in uh, Ireland. When we looked at the results from the tanks as to when the actual first spawning happened, we saw that it happened between 430 and 547 degree days, which is at least uh, off by at least more than 100 degree days to our uh, big surprise. And then when we looked at the other response variable, we found that the first larvae peak at 15 larvae per liter was actually a better predictor in that way with between 505 and 530 degree days on average. So this is a figure of what it looked like. Uh, this is the different years on the x-axis and the degree days on the y-axis. And here we plotted the actual degree days in red and the predicted degree days in blue. Uh, here you can see uh, 
very clearly an effect of a uh, year on the on the different results. So in 2019, it was uh, more closer compared to 2020 and 2021. So we also wanted to see what the relation was between the, or we wanted to group these together to get an, uh, get a feeling of what it looked like. So when we grouped the uh, group these together, these were grouped together in group A, the the what the part of the plot. This one was in group B, and this one was in group C. So you can clearly see that they're, they're depending on the year, the result was uh, very different. So then we got to the first larvae part, and then we moved into the first larvae peaks. And here we could see no effect on year. So this is, uh, there was also, uh, we, we statistically tested this, and there was also no effect on year on, this, uh, on these results, which gives you to think that Perhaps the first larvae peak is in that way a better um, thing, a better variable to use in the, within this model. So then we moved on to the experiment in Kristineberg in Sweden. We uh, had an experimental design by uh, uh, NAS here, which also uses small scale hatchery uh, systems uh, uh, and had had success with this. So we tried to replicate this, but then in a, in a land based system. Here we took temperature. We looked at the larvae again, but here we also took water samples to look uh, at for food analysis. Uh, we also had some things happening here. We had oysters dying halfway through the, the experiment. Out of the 53 oysters that we used, we had 29 of them dying. Um, we also compensated for that by replenishing some of the tanks. Um, we looked at the larvae. We had larvae spawning, so we also took a look at that. And eventually we also had all of the larvae dying because eventually we we saw no oyster larvae were left in the water and we could also find no settlement afterwards. So I will also go a little bit further into as to why we think they might have died, both the oysters and the oyster larvae. So why did the oysters die? Um, in order to for oysters to be able to spawn, they need to be uh, they need to have a healthy ratio of male to female. And in order to be able to sex them, we had to drill a hole in the top of their shells and take a, a sample from their gonads to find female or male gametes. Uh, after we've done that, we left them to rest in the laboratory for roughly three weeks. And after those three weeks, we uh, we looked at them uh, if some of them died, and the ones that didn't die, we put out in the tank for the for the um, for the actual experiment. Of course, leaving a hole in the top like this also uh, leaves a uh, leaves a very nice pathway for pathogens or bacteria. Sadly, by the time that we figured that most of them had died, they were already so far decomposed that we were unable to even take pathogen or bacteria samples uh, uh, to be able to determine if they died because of that. But it's a very real possibility. During the experiment, we also found that there were a lot of anoxic zones in at first in the tanks. So eventually we also added some pumps in order to be able to prevent those anoxic zones from occurring which is, could be another reason as to why the oyster larvae might have died uh, during the experiment. So what was the uh, reason the oyster larvae might have died? So here's a picture of one of the oyster larvae that we had during the experiment. First, we looked at the food availability, and this was, uh, this was also uh, quite an interesting result. Uh, we found uh, these two species, which I marked here, the Porocentrum cordatum and the Rhodomonas sp. So I will go into the Rhodomonas sp first, which is a very interesting species. This is a uh, type of algae which is also being fed in oyster hatcheries right now. It's known to be uh, high in fatty acids, and this is what uh, oyster larvae require to be able to grow and transition eventually into a settlement period. Uh, we used uh, um, calculations from Robert et al. to uh, calculate what the consumption for these oysters would be uh, at the first days. So with the, uh, I picked for this example, I picked tank number six, which had uh, 37 larvae per 100 microliters. So before um, before the experiment started, which shows is shown here, we had uh, roughly 3.3 uh, million of these um, uh, algae available for the oysters to be fed up on. Uh, calculating the 37 larvae per 100 microliter would roughly translate to 110,000 uh, oyster larvae in the tank at the at the time of spawning. Looking at their consumption, they would probably roughly require 2.2 billion of these oyster uh, of these algae uh, to be able to uh, to continue growing and uh, to continue to live. Uh, 
So with the 3.3 million algae that we had available during this time, we were probably would be able to accommodate 165 oyster larvae instead of the 110,000 that we had. So it's fair to say that they had a hard time uh, trying to feed upon something that they could uh, that they could eat. The other species that we found very interesting was this uh, Porocentrum cordatum. Uh, early research shows that uh, this species can be highly toxic in uh, high volumes uh, uh, in small bodies of water. Uh, they, and research also shows that this species is not necessarily on its own very toxic to, um, um, to oysters, but feeding trials of this species to oyster larvae showed that they um, roughly needed three weeks to transition from their original diet into be able to feed upon this species. And in the meantime, their digestive systems were heavily disrupted, which uh, leads to believe that uh, looking at the figure as, as this was one of the high, mostly available uh, algae to them to feed upon, that they uh, there was a fair chance that they might have starved during uh, during our experiment as well. We did, uh, of course, had some, uh, like I said, we had some oyster larvae spawning, so we did apply uh, the man's model here as well, together with the brooding time. So uh, again, on the x-axis, we see the date, and on the y-axis, we see the degree days. Uh, the first red line is the first spawning predictions, and the green line would be the second spawning predictions. Tank 6 uh, is uh, what we believe to be maybe a delayed uh, spawning from the first spawning. But first, very interesting to see is that the tanks one to four, which all spawned a little bit later, were very nicely clustered around what would be a second spawning event uh, happening. So here we uh, we do believe that we, we what we saw was a, a second spawning under um, more controlled conditions, which was uh, previously uh, uh, um, not known uh, from from natural uh, reefs here in Scandinavia, at least. So my conclusions were that the first larvae peak is probably a better predictor for uh, for uh, the reproduction cycle of oyster larvae looking at the man's model. And we tried to gain further insight into the smaller scale systems as well. So we had a second spawning from happening, which was very interesting. Probably what we should have done was uh, have a flow through system at the beginning to uh, allow more food to come in, but also at the same time uh, uh, get rid of uh, these anoxic zones, for example. And it would also be very interesting to look at the further food composition of these oysters as they require high amounts of energy and uh, the food that we had available to them in these tanks was uh, clearly not uh, not enough to um, to feed them uh, i think that's my yeah no these are other results yeah this is my uh, this is my presentation so uh, thank you for your attention thank you very much sebastian um now it's time for our Q and A session, where you can ask questions in the chat or by raising your hand and then um, unmuting <coughs> your microphone. But just before we begin the Q and A session, I just want to ask you, uh, Sebastian, uh, yeah. a bit of a difficult question. But the examples of of shellfish farms causing environmental problems in the surrounding area. Yeah. Do you think that will make shellfish culture more undesirable? Uh, I think it's very interesting. I think it. Um... Uh, there, there, it's known that there are some issues, especially at the bottom of some of the, the bivalve uh, aquaculture facilities uh, uh, in the past. I think it also shows the, of course, it's important to be more careful. And I, I can also imagine that there's other forms of aquaculture, or I can imagine, I know there's other forms of aquaculture which are more um, polluting compared to, to bivalves, but it also shows the, perhaps the importance of um, of being able to to do to produce things like this in a hatchery because it also reduces the the pressure on the on on what would otherwise be in a, a farm or a um, a bivalve farm uh, in in that way yes so uh, makes it more undesirable no I don't think so I don't think it makes it necessarily more undesirable just just more progress is needed or more research is required in that way yes yeah i think that's that's more key i would say thank you i do not see any uh, raised hands or um, questions in the chat so i'll just uh, proceed <laughs> asking yeah, questions sure. here <laughs> the, what could be the reason for the effect of the year on your results in ireland um i think um 
I think it also differs per year what, for example, is available for food and also temperature, of course, is never the same in these open systems. As you, as you saw in the pictures from Ireland, it's a huge open system. So what you could be drawing in on in 2019 food wise could be completely different in 2020 or 2021. So I think the influence, even though it's a it's a controlled way of, of um, 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 growing oyster larvae, it's still it's still a simulation that you do. So it's never it's never as fully controlled as a hatchery would be. So that's I would say that that was definitely the the reason you could see an effective year on the on those results. Oh, very interesting. Um, and what could be an excellent way of to provide oysters and larvae with food since consumption since consumption is, is, is so high? I think that's a, also a very interesting one. I know there's been uh, some research done into trying to feed them other um, 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 a way uh, with other products than algae, but those always resulted never gave any solid results. So I think finding a way of uh, producing food which is desirable to them as well, and at the same time provide a lot of energy is um, perhaps also one of the key uh it would be maybe the next step or the step afterwards to to further research because uh the the algae production is one of the it, a lot yeah they need to produce a lot of algae right to feed these oysters because they it's like a sponge for 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 algae and energy right now yes so alternatives i i i wouldn't know any alternatives right now but i think it's definitely interesting to look uh, look into what else uh, is vital for the reproduction of a uh, cycle of uh, besides temperature and food availability? Uh, I think bacteria would also be very interesting to look at. I um, um, I have a feeling that bacteria have a very, I think bacteria have a very interesting relationship with these larvae as to uh, their success of growth and their perhaps also the uh, I haven't found I haven't read any papers necessarily saying something like that, but perhaps maybe some symbiotic relationship or something where they maybe fend off certain threats for them in their in their larval phase or in their settlement phase, or maybe it, it guides them to where they might be able to settle. For example, I can I can imagine something like that. I think I think bacteria also have a very important role in their uh, in their reproduction cycle. Actually, thank you. Um... Just think there's no no raised hands here and no questions in the chat, so I just want to give everybody an opportunity to ask Sebastian a question here. If not, then I can see that we are almost all the time. But just before yeah. we leave, I just want to ask you just the final question here. What sure. would be the next step into researching the reproduction cycle of oysters? How do you, how do you take it to the next level? How do you take it to the next level? I that's a very it's a very broad question in that way. I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, personally, I would like to, uh, I would like to, I think further evaluation of the model is also very interesting because you, you can for, narrow it down. I think the model doesn't always apply to every region in Europe, for example, as well, because the, the, they, they have different traits depending on what latitude they're from. Um, and I can also see I would also find it very interesting to to work with a more um, bio bio filter in these hatcheries, for example. So you have a little bit of more a bacterial gener um, a bacteria generation in the in these in these hatcheries, which provides bacteria uh, for the oyster larvae in in hatcheries, for example, to see how much of an influence is that, and if you can see changes in the bacteria cycle depending on what part of the larval stage they're in, or or depending, or perhaps bacteria which are very beneficial, or bacteria that you absolutely do not want in these uh, in these hatcheries. I think that would also be very interesting to look at. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation in the time, yes. Sebastian. It was a pleasure having you here today. Yes, thank uh, you very much. To everybody else in the, in the meeting, I just want to say thank you for spending your time here with us. Uh, uh, I will be posting a chat here in uh, in the link in the chat for our other web webinars. If you should be interested in in, in watching them on YouTube uh, or previously uh, posted the, the, the web page for Aquavitae. Uh, thank you very much everybody for participating and uh, have a nice weekend when you when you get to it. Thanks Gus.